some of you have shown up right in the midst of Job, the book of suffering. And it may not be particularly meaningful to you to hear this scripture today. I'll try to catch you up. You've jumped right in. Job's experienced disaster. His wife has mocked him. His friends tell him to repent. And here Job responds. I love this piece. He says, if I go forward, he is not there. Or backwards, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. You ever feel like that? Where is God? Does God exist? Boy, I'm going to go back to simplistic things here, aren't I, if I'm going that far back, right? A man went to a barber shop to have his hair cut and his beard trimmed. As the barber began to work, they began to have a good conversation. They talked about many things, and eventually it got onto those one of those two subjects you're not supposed to talk about, right? Does God exist? The barber says, I don't believe that God does exist. Why do you say that, asked the customer. Well, you just have to go out on the street to realize that God doesn't exist. Tell me, if God exists, would there be so many sick people? Would there be abandoned children? If God existed, there would be neither suffering nor pain. I can't imagine a loving God who would allow all of those things. The customer thought for a moment but didn't respond because he didn't want to have an argument. But the barber finished his job and the customer left the shop. But just after he left the barber shop, he landed on the street and immediately saw someone with long Dirty hair, unkempt, and he realized something. The customer turned back and entered the barber shop again, and he said to the barber, You know what? Barbers don't exist. How can you say that? asked the surprised barber. I am here, and I'm a barber, he says, and I just worked on your hair. No, the customer exclaimed. Barbers don't exist because if they did, there would be no people with dirty, long hair and untrimmed beards like that man outside. Ah, but barbers do exist. What happens is, people do not come to me. Exactly, confirmed, affirmed the customer. That's the point. God, too, does exist. What happens is, people don't go to him and do not look for him. That's why there's so much pain and suffering in the world. What do you think of that? Here's the problem with that analogy that I just gave you. I know you're saying, yeah, the problem is it's not funny. We, we know the problem already. No, 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 a, a different problem. We are not comfortable explaining to people, explaining that people simply need to come to God. I'm sorry, let me start that over again. We are comfortable simply explaining to people that all they have to do is come to God and He's going to fix their problems. That feels good and easy, but is it true? You want to disprove the existence of God? I think that's the way you do it, actually. We're comfortable saying a joke or a story that actually reflects a non-truth. It seems so right. All we have to do to go is go to God. Right? People in this world have long hair because they didn't go to the barber. So how do we explain this problem of good people having bad things happen to good people? 
You've heard the phrase that Jesus is the Christian crutch, right? This story really perpetuates that. We're more comfortable with a view of God in the world in which he would not allow any people to suffer. But the reality is, as you know, that's just not the way things are. So, in explaining all of this, I'm going to write a book, okay? I'm going to write a book, and it's going to be a bestseller. It's going to explain why bad things happen to good people. You know, I'm sure that it's going to make the New York Times bestseller, and I'll be a multimillionaire. In fact, just, just be here. We're going to have great things happen because this church is going to be on the map. And we're going to have the answer. But here's the only problem. I don't know what to say in that book to explain it. It's not satisfying to tell people that there are actually no good people in the world. People don't like to hear that. Some of you don't like to hear that you're not actually good. That is, if you believe the Bible. C.S. Lewis, he said that the pain in that pain is God's megaphone to the deaf world. But here's the problem with that. God's purposes are more than even that. So how do we tell others of the mysteries of God? We want to have a theology that has it all figured out, right? You want to have a way to explain everything and why this could happen to someone, and you want to be ready with that answer, but the reality is that we can't. In our explanations, we will always fail. We'll fail to recognize something because we look out of a tainted, corrupt viewpoint. Only by the grace of Christ are we made right. We look out and examine the world and our theology with dim eyes. Corrupted by the sin of Adam, yes, but corrupted by the sin of our commission as well. The reality is, what we don't want to hear is that we can't really know the purposes of God. And we can find ourselves in the position of Job saying, I can't find God and I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I look ahead, I don't see him. I look behind, I look on my left and my right, and he's not there. And we get stuck. Chapter 23 is Job's stuck in silence moment. He's been afflicted. I don't know about you, I can't imagine losing, I think it was seven children, all of his possessions, thousands of animals, of his livestock, his homes were burned. He is stuck in silence as his friends tell him to repent, that he's in sin. And Job says, no, I haven't. And he's sitting in the ashes with broken pots, scraping the skin off of his skin in absolute agony with bad health now. Let's take a bit of a practical turn, though, if you will, in our thoughts on today. Many of you are believers in God, some of you maybe not, yet all of you will suffer. Great message today, Rick. What an uplifting message. Thank you for that reminder. That's just what we needed. We experience loss. You remember the chart that I drew last week? It's we, we think at birth that once we can think enough to start to imagine our future, we see it as exponential growth until we die. We don't imagine that we're going to have 
anything bad happen to us. We're never going to get sick. We're never going to get cold or flu or scarlet fever or chicken pox or whatever in the world can happen to you when you're a kid. You never see that. You never see that your mom and dad can die, your brothers and sisters can die, that you can lose loss of function throughout your body. But the reality is those things happen. We lose our possessions. We lose our spouses, our loved ones, hopefully never children, and yet that happens too. We will lose our abilities, our health, sometimes even in waves, sudden losses and gradual ones as well. And maybe you are here today for this grim reminder so that you can kickstart some recovery or maybe prepare for a loss to come. Essentially, through all of these things, what's happening in just a purely human form, we're grappling with our new identity. Every time we experience a loss, we have to change the way that we think. Not just the way we behave, but the way we understand and you, you might experience emotions or behaviors or sudden outbursts or things that you never thought that you would find yourself doing or being or thinking. But those things are truly reactions in our attempt to process this new reality. As we face loss and grieve, our brain processes memories and uses imagination to project on the future so that we cope. That's loss. That's grieving or mourning. And Job is right in the middle of that. You may not know where God is in those times. You may not hear his voice. You may be looking forward. You may be looking backwards. You may be looking to the left and the right, and you don't hear it. You might feel like you're stuck in silence, and yet today I get to proclaim something to you that's just amazing in the same way that we get to create this, be a part of this covenant with Andrew. I get to tell you something that's true that can go with you, and all I have to do is say it, and it's real. God is with you. God does see you. God does love you. He created you. You might feel stuck in silence. That was a little scary. You might feel like you're not being heard in the midst of your cosmic shouts. But God is still your creator. He is just. He is merciful. He desires a relationship with you. So my challenge today is don't stay stuck. Job didn't stay stuck. Don't stay there in your grieving or even in your belief. No matter what you believe, and yes, I hope that you find truth in the existence of God, but I hope that you don't stay there either. In the mystery that we see around us, don't just throw up your hands and say, in all of this mystery, I just can't know anything. No, keep digging into the truth. Dig into what you know. It's all a mystery, but that doesn't mean that we can't find discovery about who we are in that mystery. You may find you don't know what you thought you knew, or then again, you may find that you were right before and you found out that you don't know what you thought you knew. Quote me on that one. Give it a shot. <laughs> the point is, we have to keep learning. As much as a spiritual life has to do with the spiritual person, so much of it has to do with our brain. Fairly overlooked element. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
mind. The mind is there, right? And the challenging part is that to process things, to find that new identity in the midst of loss, takes time. Time is a crucial element. And so if I were to step away from Job, I would tell you, take the time to grieve. Take the time to process your loss. You're finding a new identity in doing that. Don't get stuck in silence. Being stuck means that you are not using your brain to process that new identity in the midst of loss. Yes, there will be denial. Does anybody know the five stages of grief? Denial. If you do, that tells me something. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and hopefully acceptance. They say that the, these stages of grief don't happen in a timeline, but I pray that it always ends with acceptance. And ex that acceptance, though, I want to change that a little bit. Not just an acceptance of the loss, but an acceptance that God has you in the palm of his hand. And as horrible as it sounds, I hope that C.S. Lewis is right for some people at least, for those who hear only silence when they call out asking for evidence of God, I hope that pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. If God, if it takes pain for God to reach me, God, dare I say it? Bring it on? Wow, I'm in trouble now. Don't stay stuck in silence. Respond to God's call to you today. Let me clarify. This is God's call to you. Don't stay stuck in silence. Respond to God's call today.